All right. So, it's just right here. Looking at 2.1 today, basics of functions. First exercise in this section um, asks us to determine whether each equation defines y as a function of x. All right. So the first one to give us is x squared is uh, x squared plus y equal to four. First step we should take on is to solve our equation for y. So if we subtract x squared from both sides, that'll be y equal to four minus x squared. Now we should put it. All right, so we have y equal to four minus x squared. Then next we want to evaluate to see if uh, multiple y values can be produced. In other words, when I plug in an x, is it possible to get multiple y values out of that one x value? I feel like I'm missing something. You know what? Let's do this. Hold on one second. All right, let's do this. I should have started right here with the definition of relation. I forgot all about that. Because I have my definition of functions right here. So if you could put a pin in there at your notes, we're gonna come back to that example. But I do want to explain, make sure we're okay with what a function is. I was wondering why I was missing something. All right, so. When you talk about functions, the first thing we want to um, go into is uh, what a relation is. And a relation is uh, any set of ordered pairs. So an example of that is one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, three sets. Uh, three, uh, three order pairs, just a set of three order pairs. So this would be an example of a relation. All right, next is the domain. That's the set of all of the first components of the order pairs. So in this case, we're talking about one, three, and five would be your domain. Your range is the set of all of your second components of the order pairs. And this example, two, four, and six. If I go up too far, feel free to let me know. You still copying? Uh, could you go back up to the range area? 
Yeah, right there is fine. So let me know when you're ready. Okay, I'm good. Thank you. All right, so the differences, direct differences between the domain and range. I already mentioned that the domain is your first components. Your range will be your second components. Also, that means that your domain will be your X values or X variables when your range and your range will be your Y variables. Domain will be considered your input, range is output. Domain is independent variable. Range is a dependent variable. Also, your domain resides on the horizontal axis when your range would be the vertical axis. All right, so the definition of a function, a function is a relation in which the elements from the domain corresponds to exactly one element in the range. So, Elements of the domain correspond to exactly one element in the range. All right, so first example, determine whether each relation is a function. If you were to do a mapping, let's say we do it this way. We have one, six, two, six, three, eight, four, nine. So one, two, three, four are in our domain, six, eight, nine is in our range all right so if we were to do a mapping you have to ask yourself is this one value in the domain going to exactly one value in the range if you answer yes for all of your x values going to one value in the, in the uh, y value or all of the values in your domain go to exactly one value in the range then it is a function so if i go one to six is one going to exactly one value the answer is yes now is two going to exactly one value? The answer is yes. Now one and two may be going to the same value, but they are individually are only going to one value. Three is going to one value, four is going to one value. So yes, it is a function. So if you can look at each one of your domain elements and declare that each one of them is going to exactly one value in the range, then yes, it is a function.
Alright, let's go look. Uh, don't worry about that right here. Somebody asked a question. I don't even know that, what that was for. All right, right here. So B, we have 61628394. Once again, if you're talking about doing the mapping, 689 is in our domain. 1, 2, 3, 4 is in the range. So you look at each element element individually. You say, is 6 going to exactly one value? And the answer is no. Because it's going to 1 and 2. So it's not a function. So, conclusions that can be made to help us see functions a little, a little quicker or easier. So, there can be a repeated value in the range, but no value can repeat in the domain. So what we mean by that is if you look at what happened here, we had a repeated value in the domain that was not a function. All right. But then when we go back up here, we had a repeated value in the range and that was a function. So there can be a repeated value in the range, but no value can repeat in the domain. Or the range can go to more than one value. The domain can only go to one value. All right, any questions so far? All right. Anybody still copying? That's it. Yep. All right. So let's go to back to this right here. So we had ordered pairs, and we were able to determine if that those set that set of of ordered pairs that relation was a function. So now we have equations, and we want to de determine whether they're functions or not. So going back to what we had started, and like I said, I forgot to establish what functions are, relations, and all the good stuff like that. So now that we've done that, determine whether each is a is each is an equation that defines y as a function of x. I should put this in equation that defines y as a function of x. So going back to our steps, we have x squared plus y equal to four. Solve for y. We subtract the x squared from both sides. That gives us the function or the equation of y equal to 4 minus x squared. Next step, we want to uh, evaluate to see if we have multiple y values that can be reduced from one x value. And that's why that was important. You know, remember, we can have repeated values um, as far as y is concerned, but we cannot have repeated x values. So in other words, if I have an x that goes to more than one, you know, y value, then that's a problem, all right? Because that means the ordered pair would be one, let's say one, three, and then one, negative three. And that's not good for us. In other words, we have repeated values in our domain. So that's what we do not want. 
But when I look at plugging in values for y equal to four minus x squared, and we will go over the vertical line test as well. No, you have a vertical line test to establish uh, looking at graphs and being able to tell if we have a function or not. Every value that I will plug in to this equation would only go to one y value and you'll see what has to be the case in order to go to multiple y values in a second and you'll, you'll see there's a clear distinction. So if you look at what we have here in the blue, each x value produces one y value. So this is a function. And if you were to keep plugging in values, no matter what value you plug in, you will only get one y value. All right, so looking at the next one, we have x squared plus y squared equal to four. And the key here that's different than what we had in the last one is that we have an even root or even power. Should I say even power? Even power that's on y because what's gonna happen is we're still gonna solve our equation for y. So we subtract x squared from both sides. And remember this equation is very similar to the last one, except the last one didn't have the power of two on y. This time we have the power of two. And then in order to solve for y completely we have to take the square root of both sides and don't forget whenever you take the square root or the even root of both sides when trying to solve the square root property comes into play you have to do plus or minus so you can already probably foresee that this plus or minus is going to bring a different element to solving or to establishing whether this is a function or not that the last problem did not uh, present to us Any problem with the solving? All right. So now when I plug in an X value, remember we want to evaluate to see if when I plug in an X value, will I get more than one uh, Y value when I plug in X? Let's say let x be equal to one. That's what I'm doing right here. If I plug in one, that'll be square root, well, plus or minus the square root of four minus one squared. That's plus or minus square root of four minus one, which is square root of three. So that means when I plug in one for x, I get positive square root of three and negative square root of three, which is a problem for us. So that means x produce two y values. Since that is the case, this is not a function. And over here, this just shows that if we had to do that same mapping like we did before, one would go to square root of three and then one would go to negative square root of three. <clears throat> uh, 
All right, any questions? Questions on the difference between the two? So whenever you have that even power on your Y, that's going to produce this type of scenario. All right, so here we have the vertical line test. If any vertical line crosses or touches a graph more than once, it is not a function. All right. All right, so looking at a circle, we draw a vertical line through it. It touches it more than once, so it's not a function. Here we have a linear equation. When you graph it, you only can draw, no matter where you draw your vertical line, it only touches it once, so it is a function. Parabola, no matter where you draw the line, it only touches it once, it is a function. And then this diagram with this graph right here, even though over here it touches it more than once, I mean, it only touches it once, I get to this part right here, it touches it three times, so that stops it from being a function. So once again, the vertical line test says that if your vertical line touches or crosses the graph more than once, it is not a function. So you'll always be able to tell if you have a function or not by its graph. Any questions? Any questions? All right. So function notation. Function notation that is uh, read f of x. Y is equal to f of x. So function notation y and f of x are interchangeable. Um, if you notice here, I have y equal to 2x plus 1. y equal to 2x plus 1 is a valid function. What makes it be put in function notation is when I substitute f of x for y, and then that puts it in function notation. All it does is it gives us the opportunity to be able to shorthand uh, information or instructions. So they could tell you to find f of 3. And that's what we have right here, find f of three. And what I was saying by scratching that out, even if they didn't say find f of three, if you want to know what f of three was, you would take three and plug it in where you see x. So that's what that says. So you take three, plug it in where you see x in the function. That means x is three. And so that's what happens right here. That's two times three plus one, because it was two x plus one. Two times three is six, six plus one is seven. So when I plug in three, I get out seven. So that means if I had to write that as the ordered pair, it also says that I have the ordered pair of three, seven.
All right. So here we have f of x is equal to x squared plus 3x plus 5. And they ask us to find f of 2 and then find f of x plus 3. So f of 2 just means I'm going to take 2 and plug it into the function where I see 2, I mean where I see x. So that would be 2 squared plus 3 times 2 squared plus 5. 2 squared is 4. 3 times 2 is 6. 4, 6, 5. Adding together is 15. All right, f of three means I'm gonna take x plus, I mean f of x plus three, excuse me, f of x plus three means I'm gonna take x plus three, plug it into the function where I see x. So that's going to be x plus three squared plus three times x plus three plus five. So don't forget x plus three squared you have to expand that out. So that's x plus 3 times x plus 3. You do x times x, x times 3, and 3 times x, 3 times 3. And that'll expand out to give you x squared plus 6x plus 9. Distribute 3 here. That's 3x plus 9, and then plus 5 in the back. x squared, and now we can combine our like terms. x squared doesn't combine with anything. 6x plus 3x is 9x, and then 9 plus 9 plus 5 is 23. All right. Let's look at a little more functions. Increase in functions, or when a function is increasing at an open interval, um, as the x value increases, the y value increases. So notice the line is going up from left to right. Decrease in functions um, on an open interval. As x value increases, the y value decreases. So you see the line is going down as you follow it from left to right. All right, if it's constant on an open interval, the x value, as the x value increases, the y value stays the same. So in other words, it's constant.
All right, so first example under this category, we want to state the intervals on which each is increasing, decreasing, or constant. All right, so for the first one, first diagram, we have this one. We have these dots here. And so they line up with the x value of 2 and negative 2. And so notice in the red I got right here that we're going to use the x values in order to establish our increasing, decreasing, or constant intervals. Um, notice when we go back to our statements, it says as x increases because we read it going from left to right. All right, so we're reading it going this way. And so from negative infinity going up to negative two is increasing. So notice it's going up. So that's why we have right here negative infinity to negative two. Then from negative two to positive two is constant. Then from positive two to the right to positive infinity is going down. And that's going to be decreasing. Two to positive infinity. These are open intervals, so you keep you use parentheses on all of them. All right, questions on A. All right, next one. Notice we're going down as we come from the left from negative infinity. We're going down to zero. After we hit zero, we go up till we hit this point right here, which will be two. And then we go down again. We'll go to the right, which is positive infinity. So once again, down, coming from negative infinity, so it's negative infinity to zero. Then we increase from zero to two. And we go back down for decreasing two to infinity. <coughs> and notice no interval was constant. All right, any questions on that? Any questions on that? All right. Relative extrema, so relative maximum, the maximum value relative to an open interval. Relative minimum, the minimum value relative to an open interval. So in other words, the largest value or the highest point in an um, interval versus the lowest point in an interval. All right. 
So if we have uh, just a mini diagram here, have this wave and we have the relative maximum. Like I said, it's relative to the interval. Um, if I had this to this, then my relative maximum, uh, let me go up some. Let me do that. So if I had those two blue lines as my intervals, then my relative max would be right here because that's the highest point in that interval. You know, so your, your relative max and your relative minimum will be dependent upon what intervals are being set, especially in something like this when it goes to positive infinity and negative infinity. So there's no real actual maximum or real minimum of that function because it goes, like I said, to infinity in both directions. That's why they call them relative max and relative mins. Any questions? All right. Definition of symmetry. Symmetric with respect to the y axis means for every point on the graph, the point negative xy is also on the graph. So the way you would test. For that type of symmetry, you would substitute in negative x for x in the equation, and it has to result in an equivalent equation. In other words, when you plug in negative x for x, once you simplify, if there is no change in the original equation, or it looks just like the original equation, then it's symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Symmetric with respect to the y-axis. For every point on a graph, the point x negative y is also on the graph. So you substitute in negative y for y in the equation, and it results in an equivalent equation. So if you plug in negative y, and when you simplify it, it gives you your original equation back, then it is symmetric with respect to the x-axis. <clears throat> All right, last one, symmetric with respect to the origin. For every point on the graph, the point negative x, negative y is also on the graph. So to figure out if this uh, symmetric with respect to an origin, you will substitute in negative x for x and negative y for y in the equation. And if everything simplifies back out to give you what you originally had, then it is symmetric with respect to the origin.
Okay, I'm all good. Thank you. Okay, no problem. All right, so here we want to determine whether the graph of x equal to y squared minus 1 is symmetric to the y-axis, symmetric to the x-axis, or the origin. Test them all out. So we want to test to see if it's symmetric to the y-axis. We substitute in negative x for x. And our original equation was x equal to y squared minus 1. So if it solves back out to give us what we originally had, then uh, it is symmetric about the, the y-axis. So we plug in negative x. So that's what I did right here. Now, to make a clean comparison, I'm going to solve my equation for x and put it in the same form that my original equation is. So I multiply both sides by negative 1, so I can get rid of this negative over here. And that gives me x is equal to negative y squared plus 1. All right. So since this is, this is not the original equation, okay, yeah. So since this is not the original equation, the function is not symmetric about the y-axis or symmetric with respect to the y-axis. The so okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and probably go ahead back like this. Not symmetric. All right, so since this I'm put it use right here. This is not the original equation. The function is not symmetric with respect to the y-axis. All right. I do I want that? So the next one we're going to test is to see if it's symmetric to the x-axis. All right, so we're going to substitute in negative one, negative y for y. All right. So plugging in negative y, and notice that's negative y squared. So when you square that negative y, that will be positive y. And if you compare that to our original equation, since this is the same as the original, it is symmetric with respect to the x-axis. All right. Questions on that and why, how to simplify it. All right, last one like this, symmetric with respect to the origin. I'll just put to the origin. So 
So you're going to substitute in negative x for x and negative y for y. And so that's what we did right here. So I had negative one, or I had a negative x on the left side. So I multiplied both sides by a negative one in order to get rid of that negative. Because I want to make a clean comparison. I had x equal to as my original equation. So I wanted to have that same relationship looking at this one in comparison. That negative y ended up canceling out like it did in the previous one. Because negative one, negative y squared is just going to be positive y squared. So when you multiply both sides by negative, it will be x equal to negative y squared plus 1. So since this function is not the original, it is not symmetric with respect to the origin. All right. Let's go. Everybody okay? Okay. So I think this is the last type of functions. Even in our functions. So the way you'll be able to tell if you have an even function is that when you plug in negative x, you get back the original function after you've simplified everything. You know you have an odd function is when you plug in negative x and each sign is the opposite of the original function. All right, so once again, when we plug in negative x, if we get the original function, it is an even function. But if you plug in negative one, say each one, negative x and each sign is the opposite, it's an odd function. And if that doesn't happen completely, then it's an even. All right, so determine whether we have an even, odd, or neither when it comes to our function. So the first one, we have f of x is equal to x cubed minus 6x. So we plug in negative x in both spots that we see x. Negative x cubed is going to be negative x cubed. So over here, I was, you know, going through, you know, if you have an odd power, then the, the result of a negative is going to be a negative. But if you have an even power, the result is going to be um, positive. So here, if I have negative one raised to the 400th power, I know that eventually I will have a positive one because negative times negative is gonna give me positive. But if I have, have negative one to the 505th power, then my result will be negative one because there will always be a negative left over that didn't cancel out. So once again, all even powers will yield a positive result odd powers will yield a negative result. So if you look at what we have here, that negative x raised to the third power is still going to be negative, and then negative 6 times negative x will be positive 6x. So compare it to the original, I have negative x cubed plus 6x. Since each sign is opposite the original function, that means it is odd. All right, next one, g of x is equal to x to the fourth 
minus 2x squared. Same procedure, plug in negative x. See if it simplifies to give you the same opposite signs or neither. So in this case, x to the fourth, once again, it's an even power. So that means we should get uh, a positive result. And then negative x, even power, raised to the second power. So once again, we get a positive result. And this negative is going to stay there because it has nothing to do with the power. And we see that we have the same equation as the original. And since this function is the same as the original, it's even. <coughs> Excuse me. But it is even. All right, last one. We have x squared. h of x is equal to x squared plus 2x plus 1. Plug in negative x. Negative x squared is x squared. 2 times negative x is going to simplify to negative 2x. That's plus 1. So our conclusion here, all of the signs are not the same neither are all the signs opposite and remember we're comparing it to the original which is right here they either need to all have been after we simplify all of them would have to be positive or all of them would have to be negative in order to be odd or even so this function is not even uh, nor is it odd All right, any questions? Got one more thing out of this section that will be done for today. All right, so we're looking at the difference quotient, something that we will use in calculus, and all they're going to do is introduce it to you um, in this section, but uh, the application, you really don't get into the application of it until you get into calculus. Uh, it says f of x plus h minus f of x over h, wherein they'll give you f of x, and then you have to find the uh, algebraic representation for f of x plus h, and then do the simplification. So that's our first, that's our example right there. If f of x is equal to 2x squared, minus x plus 3, find the difference quotient. So to give us f of x, so we need a algebraic representation for f of x plus h. So that's what we do. We take x plus h and plug it in where we see x, so that's f of x, I'm excuse me, so that's 2 times x plus h squared minus x plus h plus 3. So don't forget that x plus h squared is not going to be x squared plus h squared. That is the expansion, the binomial expansion of x plus h times x plus h. So I do you know that work right there. Just doing your binomial distribution, x times x, time, uh, x times h, h times x, h times h. So you're folding that out. And ultimately, you'll have x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. All right. So we'll distribute here, distribute that negative. That'll give us negative x and negative h back here. 
And then ultimately, once we have our, we want to make this block smaller. All right. So once we have that expansion out there, we'll go ahead and distribute that two. So this two has to hit each one of those terms. And that gives us the expression of 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared minus x minus h plus 3. So before we go any further, make sure we're okay with what we've done. We took x plus h and plug it into the function because remember, as a part of the difference quotient, we needed f of x plus h. So you take h, x plus h, plug it into your function that they already gave you, and then you expand it out doing the necessary distributions. Combine the right terms where necessary as well. All right. So remember the formula is f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So this quantity right here is our f of x plus h. This quantity right here is f of x. And of course that's our minus sign, which is this minus sign right here. All right, so we can go ahead and distribute this negative. And that gives us 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared minus x minus h plus 3. And that's minus 2x squared plus x minus three and all of that is over h. All right, so what we do now is uh, cancel out the terms that can be canceled out. So you have two x squared and negative two x squared, negative x, and positive x. Then we have three and negative three. Now each term that's left must have h still in it. If that didn't happen in some way you went wrong, each term that's left still is supposed to have H and it. it's supposed to work out that way. Because what we're going to do now is take that H that's in the bottom into each term that's in the numerator. And that's what we're looking at now. 4x h over h plus 2h squared over h minus h over h. And now what that allows for, uh, for us to do is cancel out h's. So only one of the h's will cancel out here in that 2h. Then here h over h is just one. And that's how we get this expression right here, 4x plus 2h minus 1. Uh, so quick question, why when you did the last h's where it was just h over h, it comes out to 1? Wouldn't it be 0? Uh, well, anything over itself is equal to 1. 
Oh, my bad. Sorry. Oh, no, no, you're fine. You're fine. Um, so, yeah. And so just uh, so those letters, they just represent unknown numbers. So you have to treat them the same way you would treat numbers. Mm -hmm. Good question. Good question. Be surprised at how many, a lot of people, you know, go that route. So that's a great question. Anything else? Anybody else? Or scroll up. Uh, let me see. I think this was, oh, this was just another one. So before I leave that one, everybody good on that last one. Okay. So I just did another one right here. If f of x was 3x plus 7, and we wanted to find the difference quotient of 3x plus 7, uh, once again, you would take x plus h, plug it in where you see x. And so that's what we're doing right here. This one is a little lighter than the last one. So you do your distribution. All you have is 3x plus 3h plus 7. So now if I put that in the difference quotient formula, you know, that's right here. So now we're looking at 3x plus h, 3x plus 3h plus 7 minus the quantity of 3x plus 7 over h. All right. Distribute that negative. So that'd be a negative 3x and a minus 7 in the back now. And once again, once you do your, ca um, your cancellations, um, whatever cancels out, I mean, I won't say whatever cancels out, whatever's left from your cancellation um, should have H still involved in those terms. So we're looking at 3X minus 3X. And then we have 7 minus 7. So what we're left with is 3H over H. H is canceled. And in this case, it leaves us with just 3. I think that one is the last one. Yep. So that was a little shorter than the last one, but same process. Take x plus h, plug it into your function, then subtract f of x from it. Mm -hmm. After you expanded it out, cancel out the, the like terms. Each term left should have h in it, and cancel out the h in each term is left, and then that will be a di difference quotient. Any questions, any questions? Right. So as always, try to stuff out. See if you get stuck on anything. Don't forget our deadline or our due date will be for chapters one and two will be midterm week. Uh, so that Sunday, that final Sunday in midterm week. Um, so make sure, you know, we're not waiting or sitting around on chapter one stuff. You know, you want to get that done as soon as possible. Then go ahead and get into chapter two. Uh, you get two shots of getting the best grade possible for chapter one's test. Don't forget uh, to shoot me your scratch work. Shoot me your scratch work. Any questions before we close out today? Also, don't forget to take a look at that review. Um, remember, it's not mandatory, but it's good that you, you at least take a look at it. See if you, um, it will help you to streamline your test. And don't forget, you can get extra credit on your test if you get an 85 or better on your review. Remember, set up as a homework, you get unlimited amount of tries to get the best grade possible on it. All right. So outside of that, you guys have a great night, have a great evening, and I will see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. You have a good one. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.